I need to call the meeting, this meeting to order. Madam Secretary, can you call sure. the roll? Dr. Koji? Yes. Ms. Howard? Here. Here. Dr. Hudson? Here. Madam Secretary, have you established a quorum? Yes, we have. Call the roll, please. We got oh. it right. Yeah. We've got a quorum. Oh, okay. Um, can we approve? Uh, I need someone to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion that we approve tonight's agenda. I'll second the motion. And our secretary, can you call the roll, please? Sure. Dr. Koji? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Dr. Hudson? Yes. Dr. Hudson? Yes. Dr. Shirley, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, will you stand with me, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 6.0, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, Spending plan updates. Will Black? All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, tonight, I want to uh, share some information with you about how we have used um, our uh, federal funds, uh, our COVID relief federal funds. Um, over the past year and also um, I'm interested in sharing with you some needs that our kids have um, still as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and some of those needs uh, we'll talk about are um, social emotional needs some of those needs are academic um, and there are a few other needs as well that we'll talk about so uh, to begin tonight uh, I want to uh, share with you how we spent um, some past federal grants and the, those two grants are number one what is known as the CARES Act or ESSER 1 and ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. It was passed early on in the pandemic um, and it was meant to support uh, communities and schools as they faced COVID over the past school year. Uh, that money totaled uh, uh, $1,198,235, and we dedicated that money uh, toward learning during the pandemic, T pandemic safely learning during the pandemic. So that uh, means the large majority of uh, ESSER 1 money went toward buying student devices so that we could um, give students access to virtual instruction and also to purchase staff devices to ensure that the staff had adequate um, technology to provide virtual instruction. We also uh, bought some wireless access points uh, that we early on we placed um, outside of our school buildings to help kids get access to internet when they didn't have any. And then uh, lastly, uh, we, we uh, used the money to ensure health and safety <coughs> Uh, by buying some uh, equipment that we needed to help do that. So this, this money um, has been spent and, uh, and we believe it's, you know, it, it was absolutely critical to our ability to provide instruction safely during the pandemic. ESSER 2 came along after that. Um, we are still um, in the process of spending some of that money. We have spent some and we're, we're in the middle still of that process. And, ESSER 2 was designed, um, and, and what we've used it for, is to overcome COVID learning loss. So it came out later, it came out toward the end of the school year, and that money um, we have already begun using to help our teachers prepare uh, for, um, for, for the fall when they have to help kids catch up from the pandemic. We've also um, used it to help extend our school year and our school day, uh, both in the spring and in the summer. So we had a very, very robust um, after school program as well as summer program 
Um, and just for example, at Paducah Middle School alone, we had two, over 200 kids show up every day for summer school. That's, that's pretty amazing, a very large percentage of the school. We used that money to target, um, to target students who had struggled during the pandemic, uh, get, either getting connected or staying connected. And um, we also, at the same time, have been providing very comprehensive professional development to teachers um, over this summer to, to really help them learn strategies to most efficiently catch kids up uh, from COVID. Um, lastly, we put some of that toward uh, creating uh, in instructional resources, including material, some materials and technology, as well as a robust coaching team. Um, that, that I've been lucky enough to hire to help uh, support teachers as they implement all those strategies. So because we have allocated 100% of ESSER II funds to um, direct services for kids, we um, followed the, the grant funding matrices that, uh, that KDE provided for us and that ensured that once we budgeted according to their guidelines, we received a $202,000 bonus, uh, extra money in ESSER II, so that we, that we can put toward kids. Um, and so uh, that, that was a big, you know, a big bonus for us that we're excited about and that we will definitely put to good use. And let me stop you there just for a second, Mr. Black. Um, we took that money um, between, I think, Angela and I as we worked through that um, and distributed that to our schools um, individually based on their average daily attendance and so those numbers are 28 29,000 for our small school up to about 55,000 for our high school specifically for the the, the principal and the site-based councils to work on specific needs they have um, within those schools sorry so now uh, the reason we're here tonight is to talk about um, additional needs because with the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, otherwise known as ARP, a lot of people call it ARP, uh, that, uh, that act um, has provided ESSER three monies, a third round of ESSER money that um, actually is quite a bit of money. It's $10,765,000. And um, our purpose for meeting here tonight is to share what needs the district has and to get public input on, on needs from the community. Before this meeting, we did send a community stakeholder survey out. Um, and we have some of that data also to share uh, with you. So um, the first thing I need to say about this grant is that um, 2 million or 20% or $2,153,000 worth of it must go to addressing COVID learning loss. That is a mandate of the grant. Um, so we have already identified that amount um, and we, although we haven't finalized exactly how we would spend that, we, we know that that amount has to go toward helping kids overcome COVID learning loss. The remainder, uh, 8,600,000 or so, that is, those are flexible funds. And so we have more, more choice um, as far as what to do with that. Obviously, there are federal guidelines to how we might use it, um, but uh, within those, those guidelines are relatively flexible. Uh, com you know, uh, compared to other federal grants. So what I want to share with you right now are some of the uh, needs that we already know about um, within our school district, things that we see and we've, we've maybe become more keenly aware even uh, of in the last year. Uh, so the first one uh, is, and, and, and we've kind of categorized these. The first are academic support. So COVID learning loss supports, uh, supports that will help kids catch up. And the first one, the first need that, that we, we see is the need to recruit and retain highly effective teachers. The research is really clear on this, um, especially under very difficult times, that uh, we need to maintain a high quality teacher workforce. That is the greatest, the highest leverage thing we can do. Um, and the second, uh, need is to continue to offer extended school and expanded school services. A lot of that it can be still paid for from Esther 2, but to do the kind of work we need to do on the level that we need to do it, um, we need to continue that with, with Esther 3 also. Uh, next, 
we need to expand our credit recovery options because the number of kids, even though the summer has been great for catch up, uh, Tillman has done a great job in summer school of helping kids gain credits uh, toward graduation, but we're not there yet. Um, so we, we need to expand our credit recovery system in order to kind of meet the needs of kids and get them back on track. Um, next, of course, digital instructional tools have become increasingly valuable as we've gone uh, to having every kid with their own device. And so as a result, we need to increase the number of digital tools we have. Um, we have changed our approach um, in very fundamental ways because of COVID and teachers in general, they're, they're, they like a lot of those uh, tools. Um, a lot of technology can really help us personalize instruction for kids. It can also allow us to personalize practice for kids to really important applications. So uh, we also need to continue to provide a few updated student devices, uh, and that is for mainly kindergarten through third grade. Uh, we have almost, we're almost one-to-one -one at K-3, but um, we, we still have a few more to purchase, and then after that, there are some older machines at that level that we need to update. Uh, we need to expand our English language learner resources, uh, mainly at Paducah Middle School. We know that is a need. It has been a need over, over the last year that it has become very obvious. And then the last bullet point is customized resources for at-risk kids, and this means um, targeted interventions and resources around those academic interventions for certain, for, for uh, subgroups of kids who are at greater risk of failure. Um, and we, we've, track, we've, we've tracked kids of different subgroups for years and we know, you know, we have some thoughts on, on, based on research on if we had a few more resources where we would put them to help kids um, achieve at higher levels. Uh, social emotional supports that we are uh, that we see a need for um, number one social workers we have hired um, over this past year or actually early on in the pandemic we hired a social worker for Paducah Middle School and her work was invaluable uh, she was able to go door to door um, working with families helping kids remove barriers um, provide social emotional support to kids and the need for that um, remains uh, at Paducah Middle School and also at the elementary where we currently only have school counselors. And while school counselors can bear some of that um, responsibility, we believe social workers at that level during this pandemic, especially with what we know nationally is a increased need for social emotional support uh, for kids, it, it could really help us uh, make more gains with kids. And so, uh, in addition to that, we know we will continue to need social emotional learning resources and curriculum. Um, and then we've, we've been partnering for the past few years with both Baptist Health as well as Four Rivers and Mountain Comprehensive Counseling. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful program that we have in place where kids can get access to individualized counseling while they're at school, um, of course, you know, in, in cooperation with their parents. And those those resources have, have really helped us even pre-pandemic. Now, we anticipate an, in, an expanded partnership with them. Some of that is covered outside of this grant, but I, I included it so that, that the public knew that type of partnership is in place and we're, we're continuing to, to utilize that. And lastly, there are some facility needs that we need to share with the community because as, as you all know, facilities um, have to be maintained over time and that can be a huge financial burden um, this some of this uh, ESSER money can go toward that that is allowable um, and uh, based on the grant and so some of those needs you can see there um, include uh, the Head Start uh, building uh, which a lot of a lot of which is paid for by a grant uh, and then at Tillman you can see Tillman's need is is pretty um, expansive that is this is all based on our district facilities plan and i'll let dr shively chime in if there's any additional information there but the 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 tillman need includes you know a, a variety of things across the building to keep the building um, up to date and to keep it uh, safe and, 
and watertight. So these are, these are again, uh, uh, this is a summary of, of those facilities' needs. Um, I wanted to also share the community survey results that we, again, this survey was sent out um, to our community, to our parents, um, and these are the priorities that came back. These are results that were high priorities, and, and to be honest, uh, almost everything we put on the survey was ranked in some way as a high priority. Um, but you can see them ranked in, in, in order. Uh, you can see first, access to high quality instruction being really high, uh, class, student classroom engagement and mental health, uh, safe and healthy school classrooms, um, and then on down to student attendance, technology, Wi-Fi, and I, I need to mention too, thanks to uh, the state and federal government, uh, we did have um, a, a, a program called the Last Mile Program, which came in um, about maybe a quarter, maybe halfway through last year, where we were able to provide um, Wi-Fi hotspots for kids who weren't able to get connected. So we were able to get probably over 90% of our kids connected through Comcast Cable, through the Internet Essentials Program. But that last 10%, we had a very difficult time getting them consistent Internet access. That last mile program allowed us to knock that last 10% out. And that means they had a Wi-Fi um, Verizon hotspot in their house that uh, we were paying for so that we knew it was reliable internet uh, for kids. So um, anyway, so that, that it's good to see that needs gone down a little bit. It used to be like one of the highest needs that we had. Um, then of course, behavioral supports uh, for kids. We wanna have dropout prevention, of course, you know, the community does value that. And then of course, catching up from loss of instruction. Um, I'm excited to see this, these results because they do in many ways reflect what we see as a um, what we see as a school district as, as, as priorities. And so from our side, um, this, this seems about right. So are there any questions? Any question from the board? Yeah, I have one question. Um, just, uh, just give me a clear picture if you can. When you say customized resource for at-risk at students, resource, what would it kind of look like? I think some of... When I say resources in that case, of course, it could be, it could be any resource that removes barriers for at-risk students. However, I'm specifically targeting academic resources. So for instance, um, effective, and I'm just, this is just an example, but uh, effective math intervention resources at, and that could be people or it could be programs, but to target at-risk students who are trying to get college ready on ACT. And we know, like in math, I can, I can show you some data where, you know, I, I can predict if we can put certain resources on that, on that issue, we can make some gains there and really help kids get over that, that hump on ACT before um, their senior year. You know, my goal is to get them college ready in their junior year with the junior ACT. So just, that's just one example. There might be examples at elementary, might be examples in middle school, but academic interventions that allow kids to really help remove barriers or support them in, um, in becoming <coughs> proficient or becoming college ready. Well, um, the students that had this access to Wi-Fi, do you have it now or it was for just that period? Uh, the Wi-Fi hotspot access continues, Correct. and they we are continue. still, um, you know, we, we continue to pay that through the summer due to the need to do summer instruction, credit recovery, and other programs over the summer, and we continue, we will continue that until, um, until we know that the, the need for digital access, you know, has, has been met, especially during especially, you know, if there's a need for potential, you know, virtual learning at any point. And it's safe to say that every student has those devices that they need. Every, yes, every so, because every student now, every student in fourth through 12th grade has a district issued Surface Go tablet, okay? Um, they're all Wi-Fi ready. And then, um, if we, we encourage parents first to, 
we, we want them to sign up for the Internet Essentials program because it's it's internet that is the most reliable. You know, cable internet is the most reliable internet that we've experienced in our in our city. And so it's also it, there's a it's a good deal in terms of the price, uh, at least right now during COVID. However, for our students who are transitional students, maybe they're moving a lot, uh, m moving a lot, or maybe they're having to maybe. Um, move in with friends or with other family members and in their situations changing sometimes that cable internet is really not the best option so we have an application process so that parents can access the the other divide the um, uh, hot spots so. any other question madam secretary would you call the roll we don't need no. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, is there any other, is there any community input to this? Endowment. We're going to still do that $1,000. In fact, uh, it's a young man that just 
started that we don't, we don't understand why he didn't apply for it, uh, but uh, we know that uh, incentives does make a difference. That's just a thought. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sherry, were you going to talk about this affordable housing? Yeah. Yeah. Do I? I can do it. Good evening, yeah. everyone. Um, I'll just come up here to now that um, Mr. Cleary opened the door for me. Now I can easily walk through. And I'm here on behalf of the teachers. During all this pandemic, we have been working overtime. We work, sit up and work at home late at night. And I'm just here to say that to retain the high quality teachers that we do have in our district, that we still have in our district, we want to keep them. We want to keep them um, to keep working. We want them to not work harder, but to work smarter. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, I'm working with uh, Mr. Black on the TNTP program. Um, a lot of us are. And we've put in a lot of hours in that. And it's going to be also required from the rest of the district once we introduce that program to them, which is the accelerated learning. Um, and so all I'm here to do is ask for a, as um, Mr. Cleary said, a bonus. And I know there's not such a thing as a bonus, but it, you know, there's a work, perfect word for it. But if we could give our teachers a bonus <coughs> or an incentive to keep on working hard, um, or keep on working smarter uh, so we can continue to drive our district to the highest level that our district can go to continue to shine out <coughs> in the United States like we have been. And uh, so then they can come and ask, what are y'all doing in Western Kentucky? That's what we want, to be that role model district for everybody. And I know just a little extra sometimes put a little more fire in somebody working a little bit harder. So. On behalf, I would like for you all to think about that and consider uh, giving a little extra to the teachers um, this year. Thank you all. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Um, I'd like to respond to Mr. Clary's um, affordable housing. Um, the superintendent had mentioned this um, just before his meeting. And I don't know if he's here, if he wants to share it with us. Sure. The uh, two things, and just to touch on what both of you said, um, when I look at our survey results, the number one thing from those survey results is the highest priority is is access to high quality instruction, which comes from high quality people. And so I, I think that goes right in line with our survey. So thank you all both for that. Um, Mr. Black and I have talked about. Uh, innovative ways to um, find at you know hard to hard to find hard to collect I guess or recruit teachers um, in subject areas and also how to diversify our staff um, in more than we have I think this year we, we've we've done a great job at our site-based councils of hiring but um, with that we've talked about how do we create a community um, of, of teachers and how do you support that and so um, I think it's something that uh, Mr. Black experienced with uh, Teach for America relative to not, maybe not the housing side of it, but how everybody was together, but you create that community. Um, it, I don't think it's innovative for Western Kentucky, or excuse me, for the United States, um, because I've been in Louisiana and seen some, some of the further south parishes um, have some programs like that to recruit teachers to you know the southern tip of Louisiana. But I know Dr. Hudson has shared with me as a principal outside of Chicago um, and then as assistant superintendent recruiting against districts that have some of those things um, has been a challenge at times. And so um, it's a conversation that, that we've been having for a while between Mr. Black and myself um, and a conversation the board and I have been having for six, eight months, maybe 12, relative to how can we make Paducah even more attractive? And so um, I, I think this money allows those opportunities um, because in the ESSER three funds, you didn't see this in one or two, um, but you can pay for construction, you can pay for architects, 
um, and engineering services and in one and two you couldn't do that and so when I look through at least from my viewpoint uh, when I look through the ESSER one monies the ESSER two monies and then not that we won't do more for students in ESSER three monies but if you look at the 20 percent um, that you have to do that's over 8.3 million dollars um, for for learning loss um, and I would honestly like to say that I would be um, it, w it would be right for me not to thank our community because when we think of SR1 funds and the computers that we purchased that still wasn't enough money to go one to one district wide and so um, we had some um, um, some large donations to take care of that to ensure each and every one of our children had a device from fourth grade up and so um, that was really important but relative to how we make this attractive um, obviously, uh, Ms. Morris, it pay does drive things. I understand that completely. Um, I, there is a way to do salaries within this money. Potentially, it's not a reoccurring. We don't say bonuses. We say one-time appropriations. Um, and we were very fortunate with the, this past year that we were able to do a $500, I believe, in, in May is that what it, um, to each employee. And so regardless whether whether you were um, one of our lowest paid employees or our highest paid employee, you got the same exact take home money. And so um, I think there's some opportunities there um, to look at this money this way, if that's the way the plan goes um, as we go forward um, with that. But I do see some opportunities in our community um, in Paducah um, to be creative potentially on, on the housing side. And so um, I've been getting some ideas from some principals already. So thank you all. So JW, I was surprised when you mentioned it. I said, wait a moment here. <laughs> Dr. Shively had talked about this just before the meeting. Right. So, and yeah. thanks for your contribution. And thanks, Ms. Morris, for, I think the board, the board will surely look into it. We yeah. all need the bonus, especially the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I add that the, uh, you know, this is the challenge I think that we're in right now in education. Um, is, is attracting and we've been fighting hard um, over the last four or five years in public education to ensure that it's still a great equalizer, that it's, as I've said to our community, we need talented people to ensure you have a talented workforce. And you know, we know that at the chamber they need a talented workforce when you're talking with business and industry, and so we have to have talented employees too to create that. And so um, one of the challenges that I see is our executive director of the Western Kentucky Educational Cooperative shared with me last week that in our 27 districts, um, there's 18 openings for high school math teachers right now. And so that's a hard area to um, address at the moment. And you know, to be a high school math teacher, you have to have a high school, or excuse me, a college math major um, or probably an engineering, accounting, something like that relative to the math field. And so um, it's a challenge to find high quality um, teachers and then also, you know, in certain specific subject areas um, and, and there are um, critical areas that the state um, declares every year um, and mostly those are math and science, but we also know that um, it's our goal and has been for a long time to diversify. And so I think that's an opportunity to uh, help us there too. So, um, as we look at that. Got a couple questions. It seems that we've got technology covered under this, where everybody will be taken care of, am I correct? That seems to be... Technology. Under ESSER, the three yes. money? Yes, we've got the every school, needs covered. Yeah. So, for instance, God forbid we had to uh, do virtually and everybody will be covered. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 sir. That Correct. Good. Um, and it seems as if uh, we're looking at after school programs, what can really. Um, let me ask you this question. I was concerned about, especially our primary kids, uh, <clears throat> them getting behind. So are we professional development? Are we covered to help teachers in that area? Uh, especially where kids may not have gotten a, a solid foundation in terms of reading or math. Is that covered? Yes, yes that is uh, what we've been working on this summer with, at, actually we're doing it at elementary, middle, and high. Uh, 
we are working with teachers in, in each of those teacher leaders in each of those uh, areas and they we are learning um, an approach uh, called learning acceleration which is um, an approach to uh, that is that comes out of a, an a, a study called Opportunity Myth came out in 2018, and also from the experience of Hurricane Katrina, when you have a, a really large um, uh, scale achievement gap uh, that occurs because of external problems like something a natural disaster, and so we are. Um, we're using that research and the best practices out of that to um, to, to facilitate um, a week of professional development, preparing teachers, um, to, and, and, and we're, we're teaching them strategies that I, that I consider good teaching, but that really focus on um, how, how to provide grade level instruction, even if a student has some learning gaps. Maybe they didn't learn all the second grade skills that they needed to, but we can still teach them on a third grade level by, by using these approaches. Now that also involves um, uh, academic interventions that are at, at uh, you know, that are done both inside the regular classroom and in a pullout uh, setting. And those, and, and our teachers have been doing those for years, uh, so they are trained on how to do those interventions. Um, and, and that's part of the at-risk, the, the, the uh, resources for at-risk students. That includes um, not just that training, but more resources and, and maybe even as needed more interventionists or you know, maybe bringing more people to, to bear if, if needed in those situations. Um, the, but you know, you, unfortunately, the, the, the problem that we have here due to COVID is so the scale is so large that really the, the solution has to come both inside the regular classroom and in the pullout. I mean, it has to be a full scale system. I guess one of the questions I'm, I guess in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, um, I know that you got a week long of professional development, mm -hmm. but will that be enough to sustain teachers throughout the year? We used to do, when we had, at my school district, we did professional development, we would have sometimes Saturday training for teachers and they would get a, a stipend for doing all of that. And I'm just wondering, do we have enough to sustain them? Yes, sir. We, we, have, we, we have a couple of uh, supports. One, uh, we have this district instructional uh, team that involves some coaches, uh, instructional coaches, uh, myself, um, as well as an instructional specialist who's a an, trained administrator, certified administrator. And that team is, is actually going to be focused on supporting teachers in implementing these strategies. Okay, so that is going to start with walkthroughs, a whole system of walkthroughs supported uh, by this, by a coaching model developed uh, again by research. And then as we see, as we're assessing how well it's being implemented, um, where the, where the, you know, our, our gaps are in learning, we're going to fill those gaps as we go. So in professional, I, we, we're starting with one week, but then we have built a professional development calendar to address those needs through the year. Okay, and so some of that will happen in workshops after school, but some of them will happen on, on a full PD day as well, a full professional development day that occurs throughout the school year. Um, so we will continue to do that um, through, through the school year and then into we see this really as a three or four year process. So we're talking about professional learning that is just continuous that whole time. And again, all based on data, based on what we observe and also based on how students achieve. Okay. Let me, oh sorry, I just want to expand on that if you don't mind. One of the things, the way we set up our school calendar this year that we approved, I guess in June, would be those days on the front end um, that we do have teacher leaders that are working on that over the summer to help share that. But we all that's not just training those first six days for our teachers. There's some time for them to sit and work on getting out in front of that. Right. Um, and so time to, to actually apply it to their lessons with coaching. And so I, I think that's going to be helpful. But uh, Ms. Morris, I'm going to go back to what you said. And I said this earlier to the, our elementary team is, 
you know, so the best advice I ever got was from my mom that taught 30 some years, and you, it's, you can never forget what it's like to be a teacher. And so the challenges of continuing at through the year I hear um, and understand and nod that um, I know how important it is for our children, I know how important it is for our community and, and our families, um, but there's going to be um, a challenge to stay out in front of that um, and to do that effectively. Um, it, it can be done, and I know we're going to do it, but um, it's going to take some, some time outside the school day um, and the normal teacher work here, which is not, you know, nine months. It's, it's a full year job. Um, and so that's, um, that's a big part of, of what we're doing going forward. Um, not only our elementary, but our middle and our high. So. So, so pretty much every, not down to the penny, but you've got all the money encumbered in this in ESSER 3, am I correct? No, 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 sir. We, we, we've only used ESSER, ESSER 1 money we've spent. Mm -hmm. ESSER 2 money we have budgeted. Right. Some has been used, but not very much. Uh, are we, it's what about 400000 Okay, 400000 And so ESSER 3 has not even been budgeted. We, have, we haven't submitted a plan yet. Okay, could I make a recommendation out of you? Sit down with each building principal and mm -hmm. maybe some staff and find out what are the things that's overwhelming them, things or challenges that they, they feel that they may encounter, and say, if you had a budget, what would, how would you, you know, find out what they need. Amen. Uh, Amen. I, I think with every building principal and maybe select staff, whatever, grade level leaders, I'm not sure how they do it in the buildings, just to get a pulse of what they need. So as you plan to look, uh, spending S at three, that would be a good idea. And then the last thing is uh, uh, homeless. Mm -hmm. Where are we with, uh, how is that? They are um, absolutely included in this planning intentionally. Um, we did get, we successfully um, applied for the McKinney Vento grant, so we, we did receive that. Um, and Heather Anderson um, and, and, and I have been planning, I mean, all through the, the first summer of the pandemic, we were troubleshooting how do we connect our transitional students. Now what we're asking is how do, and even this summer, she had a special um, set of supports in place for um, transitional students during um, summer school so that they were served in a in a way that met their needs and 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 so we are closely tracking you know their progress as well as planning for you know which interventions do they need in particular uh, it, you know sometimes it's it's something very it's something non-academic you know very often it is and so she she has done a great job of figuring out you know which which groups do they need which intervention groups do they need to be part of you know a certain, if, if there's a certain need that needs to be met certain relationship that really works um, that's the kind of thing they need and in terms of their basic needs of course um, I'm, I'm excited that we've gotten that grant again that's gonna that's gonna help provide that she's also done a great job of, I'm sorry there's, there's one more thing she's done an incredible job of marshalling community resources, leveraging community partners uh, to help support transitional students. Not that this is the volume of money that we're looking at in SR3, but that's one reason that the, the set-aside money the Kentucky Department of Education did for SR2, and said if you put 85% or more of this towards students, they'll give you X dollars per child. That's, that's one reason I feel like we were, you know, it's important to get that in the hands of the teachers and the principal at the building level to say, hey, take off with this. Um, I will say that uh, the training for our finance officers on how to spend SR3 money, and I think the, uh, um, the, the formal training on that was July 15th, and so our tentative plan is due Friday, the 31st, and so that does not mean that we can't adjust it. Um, and then our rationale for the research-based instructional strategies is due at the end of August, and so there is a third of that money that they'll hold back until they approve that plan. And, and obviously there is a, a process that gets rejected to add to that. But in the learning loss in ESSER 3, we will have research-based strategies um, that we will have included in that plan. 
And so um, when we look at, uh, I'll share this just as an information, when we look at our summer school that we ran in June, and so that was the high school, middle school, all three elementaries, um, transportation that we were running each and every day, you know, that was over a $450,000 um, commitment this summer that we foresee to be multiple summers long. We, we need our teachers to, and our instructional staff, and our bus drivers, to, and our cafeteria workers, and our custodians, not to get worn out. But um, at the same time, we, we've got to have employees step up to do that to ensure we get that services to extend the school year. Um, and I think when you were talking about instructionally a second ago, Will, as far as catch up and interventions, I do think we also have to constantly remember that as, as administrators of the district that um, several years ago our board did approve that we could mandate um, tutoring after school um, and we need to provide transportation but that's a tool too to extend the school not just the school year but the school day um, if we need additional time that we can't find within you know from 8 to 3 at the elementaries or 7 30 to 2 30 at the middle of high school and we do receive money from the state for extended school services but we know this some of this money is going to go to expanding that right. um, throughout the year and so as we budget that way, I, I think I can tell you summer school in at least one month will cost us about $450,000 every year. Um, and we're looking at what that's going to look like for a year, but you'll have a budget. And then once you do the year, you'll know about what it costs and that it'll be a little bit easier to um, continue forward with that. But I, I do know that our principals have shared some concerns. Um, I don't know if Fanny walked in just a second ago, or not a second ago, you've been here for a while, but if you get this, I know the, the social, emotional, mental health and social worker is something that she brought up in a meeting, I think last week, um, last Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so we're, we're trying to do that as we do this with a time frame of, we've got to get it to the State Department on Friday. And this SR3 money, we've got to spend the SR2 money first. Mm -hmm. They're going to be looking at us to spend all of that money before we can even tap in to the SR3. And the SR2, we have until September of 2023 to spend, and SR3 we have until 20, September of 2024. Wow. Yeah. And to add just a little bit more, one of the emphasis on the way the grant for SR3 was written is you're, you have the ability to upgrade HVAC equipment, and we've got some areas that that's um, very much needed. The, the, for example, Tillman's HVAC system was put in my second year teaching here, and so that's 23 years ago. Um, but when you upgrade that, it, it provides you the opportunity to put the Mirror 13 filters in, um, which will capture the virus and also put UVC light um, in, the, in the system that will kill the virus. And so um, I think there's opportunities like that that we can take advantage of on the front end of SR3 that you came to and definitely couldn't the one that we spent. Yeah, we call it soft money, you know, uh, writing grant. And the philosophy was get the best bang for your buck because mm -hmm. you don't know what you, you know, yeah. Any other input from the community? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, so I'm definitely for all of the, the TNTP stuff, the professional development and things like that. And to piggyback off of what Ms. Morris already said, uh, incentivization is great when we are giving teachers that extra funds, but could we also save a little money to uh, invest in teacher health and wellness uh, in that regard? Money is great. I'm not saying it's not, but the raise is always great, or not a raise, one-time appropriation, however we call it. <laughs> but uh, the past year was extremely taxing on set. Um, on my part, I know that I had teachers who were either in this building or out of this building that would give me a call, and I mean, would be in tears because the work is expensive and it's stressful and it's dangerous. Uh, well, not dangerous, but just overtaxing. Mm -hmm. And so to invest in things that are benefiting teacher health and wellness, um, which is not necessarily money. Money is great, but you can't always compensate for good rest and time. And just for those things that take the stress off and the edge off for teachers to be able to function and do their job. Uh, it is very challenging of what the pandemic has done to us uh, and how teachers are continually having to do more. And I know we're working smart, uh, but there, there is a, 
um, there is a stop point at that where you're working so smart your brain hurts. And so I think if we can put a little extra funding towards teacher health and wellness, uh, in addition to all of the other things that were there, I think that's going to be very beneficial in the long run. Thank you. Amen. Good evening. Uh, I guess I, this is my first ever school board meeting, so uh, I'm new to this, so I'm just following the lead. Everybody else, they got up and talk. Uh, for, I'm Marlon Wood. I, uh, my daughter will be a senior here this year, and I just first and foremost want to say thank you to each and every one of you for what you do. I hope you sit here with the same passion today when you answered your call to teach years ago. Uh, mental health and wellness that he dis discussed, it can burn you out. You can get burned out and not have that passion anymore. And I hope you maintain that passion. And that, you know, like me, I'm very, very interested in the future. My passion is our future. And y'all are investing in our future, in our children. And so I hope you maintain an excitement. If you've lost it, I hope you regain it somehow through initiatives and things. Uh, it's been very, very encouraging to me tonight to be here. Um, I am not a do-nothing kind of dad. Uh, and I might offend you, it's not intentional, but sometimes I'm not tactful. And I may say the wrong thing the wrong way. And rarely will I say the right thing the right way, but. I applaud you guys. I appreciate it. I know it's been a challenge. Uh, I cannot begin to imagine the challenge you faced, and so I want to say thank you very much. Um, one thing is I hope in all ways possible we can stay in school uh, and let our children uh, blossom and grow. I, I did the mass. I've driven. We are uh, from South Marshall. It's 37 miles one way to get here to get my daughter here, and this will be our fifth year Amen. of doing Amen. this, and I've driven over 140,000 miles Amen. so far, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to only doing it for one more year. But, uh, uh, thank you to y'all. We are here because of the good academic program, reading, writing, arithmetic, science, and performance art. I think those are the most important aspects of education, especially performance art and how you can encompass everything in reading, writing, arithmetic, and science in that. But you've got the feeder program down in the elementary schools and in the middle schools, and you have brought my daughter's level up. And for that, I am very, very grateful. My wife and I are thrilled that we've got a, a gentleman graduate hopefully uh this year um, and being as i played football against you guys i still don't know that i'm a tornado uh, thank you thank you all for what you do and to you sir thank you for serving in the community um i i am concerned of what i see happening i don't i turned my tv off 15 years ago i don't have a computer other than this thing and i get enough garbage out of it but what I'm seeing happening in school board sessions on the left coast, the right coast, north, Amen. south, Amen. all around, it's getting pretty heated and we're, I'm concerned about what we're going to be teaching uh, in some aspects. But number one, who can we trust? When it comes down to, you've got my child, I trust you guys, but who are you trusting in making decisions? And so. Uh, again, thank you so much for what you do and what you've meant to my daughter. It's changed her life, and, and it's been a blessing for her parents. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That was heartfelt. I appreciate being Amen. Amen. So often we don't get those positive Amen. comments and that kind of encouragement. But you, you spoke from the heart, and I'm thinking if you're not tackled, that's very tactful. That was, like, that was really Amen. just heartfelt. Amen. And it was encouraging. I'm quite sure that Dr. Shiley felt the encouragement. Will Black and all those who serve our children, I think, as a yes. board as well. It, you, you spoke from the heart. It really meant a lot. That carries a lot of weight. And yet, 
it ignites a fire in us to keep on doing it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Keep Amen. on keeping on. Yes. Amen. Thank you. No doubt. Any other input from the community? Uh, I'm walking, oops. I'm, I'm walking out close down. down. Thank you. Um, I say that and um, don't forget we're a whole. And it's it's not just it's not just the administrators. It's definitely not Donald Shiley or Will Black. Don't take that wrong, Will, but um, <laughs> it's 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 our cafeteria workers, it's our custodians, it's our instructional assistants, it's our maintenance, um, it's a whole. And uh, we're, we're very fond of Blue's Best, or at least I am, and so I heard Blue's Best all through that. So thank you, but it's, it's, uh, it's all of us working collectively together um, and for children, and that's the most important thing. And um, not to get into COVID, um, I think we'll have something out by the end of the week relative to our thoughts, and I, I just would say we need to be prepared for lots of different things, um, you know, from maybe no mask to full mask. Um, is what we know could happen going forward. It's just, you know, it, it can change daily. Um, and to the, uh, I think our focus, uh, I know mine, is on the children in Purdue Public Schools. And so there might be some noise on one it coast or another coast. It's what's best for the children of Purdue Public Schools. And I've, um, since day one as superintendent, I've talked about we are here to serve this community, to build a better community. And so um, it's, it's, you know, the building we sit in is about how we align kids to opportunities here. So um, that, that's our focus, at least that's my focus, and I know that's our board's focus is children, and it's our children. So thank you, um, and I don't, want our, I don't want anybody that works for us to think we're moving them out. It's, it's extremely important work, regardless of what job you have here. Any other question or comment from the board? If there is none, can we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> and our secretary, can you call the roll? Dr. Cody? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Dr. Hudson? Yes. 